So I'm going to talk to you about Internet for Africa, African science and also civil society. Internet, you all know, we all use Internet in our daily lives. There is no point in elaborating on this. But I want to show you that the driving force for Internet is still a science. And in particular, uh, Internet introduced new ways of research, of collaborating. And for instance, CERN, could, where the web was invited appropriately, could not work without. As you've read in the newspapers, the LHC is now working, not yet collisions, but I have extracted a simulation of what we expect not to happen, that is a micro black hole decaying by Hawking radiation in the Atlas detector. Now, this uh, can be shown now, not only if you're sitting at CERN, but if you're sitting in Casablanca or Islamabad. And it's not only for CERN, high energy physics, but also other types of research that this is valid. So uh, what, is, what is now uh, true is that you have research and education network all over that allow people to do all kind of research. Now, in Europe, we have a academic network, research and education, which has 40 million users, it's the largest in the world, and it now relates, for instance, Geneva to Paris or London at 10 gigabit per second because this was indispensable for certain people and also other research. Now you're going to ask me, does it impact ordinary people? Yes, it does. Because five years ago, uh, when uh, CERN and others proposed this, the internet provider said, why spend money? With 150 megabytes per second, we can provide our customers with what they really need, which is one megabit per second. And now, because it works, you have an offer, for instance in France, and I suppose soon in, in Geneva, of 100 meg per second. Why do you need this? Well, if you want to uh, upload you know, films, you may need it. But this just tells you that there is an interface between the needs of advanced science and the needs of consumers. Now, uh, this network, which you see here, is also connected to other networks in other parts of the world, in America, in Asia, and in the world internet. But here comes, in fact, the theme of this meeting, which is alone in the world. Well, Africa is alone in the world. Look at the connectivity of internet, which was captured on one single day in 2008, and you see all these dots, and you see that Africa is almost black. So is part of South America, but Africa is the worst. Now, the numbers are here. You have one billion people, and they're going to be two billion in 2050. We learned this from this preceding video. Only five or six percent are connected, but connected means there to be five or 10K which means downloading an email will take you about 10 minutes, not to speak of a picture. The only privileged people who have some kind of broadband, which I defined as 256K, are 1% of that. And the question is now, why should we care? Why should world science, what should European taxpayers care about that? Well, because we need them. Science now needs universal coverage. If you want to trace climate change, if you want to trace epidemics of human or animal health, you need to know what's going on everywhere, including in Africa. And also, if you want to know what are the resources in medicinal plants in the African forest, you really need these people. And last but not least, there is an ethical concern. You're not going to leave out one billion people soon to be two billion in a, at our doorstep. Now, the people in Africa, researchers, uh, do not have the resources that we have in Switzerland or France. And so the only way they can do, either they travel, but that's very expensive if they want to do some research with European or Americans, or they need to have networks of universities among themselves to unite our resources and communicate uh, with us. So uh, 
Back in December of, uh, in 2007, our foundation convened a small meeting in Montpellier and uh, with uh, representatives of uh, eight African countries and we brainstormed for two days and we duly transmitted the result of this brainstorming to the European Union. It came as at a It came at an appropriate moment because there was this Lisbon summit between Africa and Europe in December 2007. And when we came to, uh, to Brussels the week, the month after to report, the people, the officers and the Director General Info Society told us, look, you're absolutely right, but we know all this. We've known it for years. The thing is, we're dealing with 52 countries and they're independent and you're not going to tell them what they need. It has to come from them. So they told him, look, it's very difficult. But what was almost impossible happened one year after. It is one year ago, on the 1st of October 2008, there was a meeting between European commissioners and African commissioners, and they agreed to put on the priority list, there were 19 lighthouse projects. Most of them, to my mind, were not very interesting. But uh, they agreed to put two of our projects in uh, priority. One of them was Africa Connect, to connect this network, which you've seen for Europe, to the networks which are barely existing in Africa. So there's enormous obstacle to do this, uh, first of all, the cost of connectivity, the lack of infrastructures, and the enormous distances I will show you. Setting up these famous networks, which we consider way of life, are not there. And then there are legal and regulatory obstacles in various countries because they are state monopolies. Now, this happened in Europe 15 years ago. You remember France Telecom, Swisscom had monopolies and you could not set up your own network. But this is happening there and it's only competition could solve the thing. And then, of course, there's the lack of qualified personnel. You need some capacity building. So all these obstacles will have to be surmounted. Now, the cost of internet in sub-Saharan Africa is prohibitive. What you get for 29.90 and whatever unit, which is a one megabyte per second, a few megabyte per second connection for one month, is cost higher than the income of an average household there. The cost in Africa is $5,000 a month. And in West Africa, it's even more, it's $8,000. So, uh, compare this with what we have, which is much less. Why is this? Well, there are two reasons. First of all, the lack of infrastructures until July of this year, July 2009, I'm going to talk about this, there was only one cable connecting West Africa to the rest of the world. And then, even more so, there are monopolistic practices by incumbent telecoms. So this was a situation, only one cable called SAT-3, and by the way, SAT-3 is not for satellite, it's for South Atlantic. And it is run by a cartel of state monopolies which prevent competition. And 80% of the traffic is done by satellite, and this is very expensive and introduces some delays. For instance, you cannot use Skype and things like voice over internet protocol. So in the absence of competition, prices are very high. This is the main reason. Now, the consequence, of course, is that most universities with hundreds of staff and tens of thousands of students only have the bandwidth that you will have in your home. And the consequence is that students cannot access university network and they have to resort to internet cafes, which is not cheap. 
that charged an enormous price for low bandwidth. And so this is really uh, something which should not exist. Now, something happened in July of this year, uh, even though there were a lot of talk about uh, governments coming together to get more cable, etc. A private company called Seacom managed to raise the money to have a cable starting in Marseille, going through the Suez Canal, with a branch to Mumbai and the Gulf, and all, all the way to uh, South Africa. What is interesting in that is that the management of CECOM, the CEO is American, the vice chairman is French, but the capital, 80% of the money, comes from African investors. So that's very interesting because we knew that there are very wealthy people in Africa and they finally understood that it's better not to invest their money not in the 16e arrondissement de Paris or in Kensington, London, but in their own country where there's a tremendous potential. I forgot to tell you that even though the number of internet subscribers is so small, it has risen 1300% in eight years since 2000, which shows that there is an enormous potential there. Now, more is to follow in the next two years uh, with a lot of cables coming. And so uh, I figure that in 2011, there will be an extra uh, around 10,000 gigabits per second, which means the capacity in three years from 2008 to 2011 will have grown by a factor of 15 which indeed is very encouraging. And already uh, the prices have gone down. Now, I mentioned that for an effective connection with our network, Géant, the, there should be groupings within Africa. There is one grouping which they call Ubuntu Net, an alliance. And look at that. This covers Southern Africa and Eastern Africa. And this area, which is only a part of Africa, would have a dimension where China, Europe, and India put together would fit in. This just tells you that Africa is huge. It has enormous resources, enormous population. But of course, to have the infrastructure there will take uh, some time. Uh, West and Central African universities have been slow for the reason which I don't fully apprehend. But they're starting to organize themselves, so I think it will move fast also. Now, of course, those people who are already organized will come as priorities when the European Union invests a modest sum, relatively about 12 million euros, to have the first wave of Africa Connect probably uh, in the next two years. Now, beyond research and education, what are now the benefits for the situation? You could ask the question, uh, if I have more uh, people uh, connected to the internet, how does the GNP per capita grow? But th there is a better metrics, uh, and this has been suggested by Amartya Sen, which is called the HDI, Human Development Index, and this takes into account, it's a more people-oriented metric, it takes into account the lifetime expectation, education, health, uh, literary education, and it is very nice to see this correlation. You see this is a log, scot, uh, log scale, and as the number of uh, hosts, internet grows, so grows the internet, uh, uh, the, the HDI index. Finally, uh, let me give a broad view of what are the benefits from um, ICT to Africa. It started with cell phones. Uh, this has been a tremendous success with about 50% growth in the, next, in the last few years. And there's about 300 million cell phones now in Africa. And they, people use it very creatively. For instance, to transmit money from the diaspora to home or from town to country for your grandmother. Uh, they don't have the banking infrastructure. From abroad, 
Western Union takes them an enormous amount. So they have developed very ingenious thing. You send the coded messages of a few seconds by cell phone, and this means give my grandmother 20 euros. Uh, if, uh, for that, you don't need a lot. Now, there's the so-called e-government. You can spend, uh, you can pay your taxes, you can fill forms by internet if you have, and you don't need such a broadband. Uh, farmers can bet, get a better deal selling their crop because they know what is the right marketplace. They also can get advice on good practices. And if you have broadband, this opens further possibilities, which are e-medicine, e-learning, and maybe even e-surgery. So e-learning, I think, will have an enormous uh, capacity, uh, an enormous influence on capacity building in Africa. This is really the future. Think of these people who do not have textbooks, and etc. If they can have access to screens, uh, that's, uh, I think, very important. Finally, uh, we have to fight the scientific divide. This is a map of the world where the territory is proportional to the number of published scientific papers. And you can see that indeed uh, African science is presently contributing very little to the world science, much less that it's in, than its potential would be because Africa is indeed full of talent and enthusiastic students eager to learn in universities that are sadly missing the most basic facilities. Uh, ICTs are indeed offering a way to jumpstart this development and uh, I think there cannot be a sustainable development if we do not share our knowledge with the educated elites which are striving to introduce that continent into knowledge society. And I think this is the responsibility of our generation and a strategic objective for the future of a civilization based on reason. Thank you. <laughs>